God. When I was growing up here, uh, the sense that I had about my future, about my doors that were open, the opportunity, the access to resources, it was big, it was broad. I was infused with the love and the support and the guidance of family that is actually here right now in the audience. And I felt like I could do and be whatever I wanted to do, and I could be whoever I wanted to be. This space, this home gave me that, this high school gave me that. Five years after I graduated from high school here, I taught at a very different high school. I taught at the high school on Rikers Island. The high school on Rikers Island because New York is actually one of two states where we automatically treat 16-year-olds like they are adults in the criminal justice system. That means that if a young person at age 16 is arrested, they go into criminal court as opposed to family court. They spend time inside of an adult correctional facility rather than a juvenile facility. And if convicted, they will leave with a felony, an open record, as opposed to a juvenile adjudication. The high school on Rikers Island is a place filled with violence, filled with trauma, and it is a place where young people who are only about two miles from the young people inside of this building look out at their future, and rather than seeing streets that are paved with green lights, they see streets that are paved with red lights, stop signs, and dead ends. New York being one of two states that automatically treats 16-year-olds like this, and I didn't know it until I was teaching inside of that system. I thought about myself, and I thought about my journey. I thought about my green lights and the red lights of my students. I also witnessed on Rikers that this is a system that is not just broken. It is deliberately constructed, deliberately constructed to disproportionately impact poor people of color. 85% of the people on Rikers Island, 85% of anyone who is there is detained. They have not been found guilty of anything yet. They just cannot afford their bail. Similarly, 93% of the population is black and Latino. My young students looking out at the world, this is what they saw. Red lights, stop signs, dead ends. The ability to find work, the ability to go back to school, the ability to even sometimes live in their own public housing, denied, access denied. As a result of this, the external barriers truly build internal walls. When we think about ourselves, when we think about the future, we cannot think about choice and optimism if we cannot think about options. And 70% of the young people that I worked with who were filled with curiosity and intelligence and ingenuity, 70% of those young people would return back into the system within three years of going home. Now, I came to teach on Rikers Island because I believe very much in alternative education. I do not think that everyone learns in the same capacity. I do not think that classroom setting is necessarily the best setting for everyone. I uh, often, when talking about this work, use a Albert Einstein quote that I always butcher and probably, I know actually for a fact that I'm going to do it again right now, but it is the quote, uh, you, cannot, you cannot judge a fish by its ability to climb trees. And I truly believe that that sense of what we have placed in terms of what education looks like and is for, for young people in our society is a great reflection of why we need to think differently about a classroom. One of the only areas of light inside of a truly devastating uh, environment that is Rikers Island was a culinary arts class. Inside of that class, my young students were, were thriving. 
there were focused and disciplined and excited. There was the smell and the taste of things cooking. I remember very clearly that experience of having a young person be able to cook something for you and share it with you, and then you to eat it and have the, just the joy of the food that was going into your own body and that reaction, that experience, that human connection. It was so human and so pure, and it reminded me of the times in my life where food brought together community, where my parents, be it my mom's amazing cooking, although she'll deny it, that brought me together with my own family almost every single night, or my dad, who's the person who like is on every food app figuring out where we're gonna go next and how we're gonna explore the, the next place we get to visit. I realized that through food, we have the ability to connect and we have the ability to learn. I also was witnessing firsthand injustice every day. And I was called to action inside of one of my own English classes. Inside of one of my own English classes, I taught the book A Raisin in the Sun. And if you recall, the first poem inside of A Raisin in the Sun is a Langston Hughes poem, A Dream Deferred. In that class, we were talking about dreams. And uh, Jeremiah, who was a student of mine, was up front, very, very, uh, just really excited about, about the opportunity to be in a classroom setting, to learn, very eager student. And he asked me, you know, do you think I can become an architect? So I gave him this, you know, uh, this really thoughtful answer, which was, you know, honestly, Jeremiah, I, I, I do. I, I, I want you to know that I think it's going to be a really long and hard road. You're going to have to leave here. You're going to have to go back to school and work really hard, graduate, go to a professional school. I have to tell you also that not every architect is a famous architect. It actually is kind of a struggle. Uh, but yes, you know what? You have the math skills. You have the focus. You have the discipline. And as I was saying yes for the teachers in the room who can relate to this, my student who was passed out asleep in the back woke up and he said, oh, hell no. And I said, Garcia, welcome to class. We're really happy to have you. Uh, and he said, no disrespect. I appreciate what you're doing here, but you're selling dreams. And I realized that he was right. If I was not working directly to think about how we broaden access to opportunity for young people who are coming home, that I was, in fact, selling dreams. Seeing that injustice, recognizing the power of food, wanting to think about how the red lights that young people coming home face get turned into green lights through channels to access opportunity, I started Drive Change. We see business as a vehicle for learning. We use the food truck industry to run a year-long fellowship for young people who are coming home from jail and prison. We're a 501c3 hybrid organization that wholly owns an LLC subsidiary. But the point for us is that business is a tool for learning. Industry is a tool for learning. I'm an educator. I recognize the need that people have coming home by way of employment. But young people who come home also need the continuation of learning and education, and I believe that business can do that. Our fellowship experience, it consists of a few different phases. We use the actual business itself as the model for learning. So every week, young people are experiencing the kitchen classroom, the food truck classroom, and then in addition to that, we teach about five to six hours a week of professional development. And what that looks like is, let's use the industry as a tool to teach classes like social media, marketing, money management, hospitality, culinary arts, recognizing that by the nature of doing, we have also the nature of learning. Now, there are components of our model that we believe really contribute to the impact that we're looking to make and see. We're cultivating community. We're giving people real skills. 
And we're also really recognizing that as somebody is thinking about their future, their own sense of self, the skills that they have, and the exposure to the world are all going to contribute to those green light streets that we want to see for youth. We recognize that every single one of our fellows, we want to be in a position after the fellowship where they are going to obtain preferential employment opportunities. Now, when we say preferential, we don't mean preferential for the poor. We mean preferential, as in any opportunity that any person sitting here would ever think of for themselves. And we want to think about how, not just through our own fellowship design, but through connecting with the public and recognizing that together, collectively, there is ownership in our ability as opportunity holders to think about business as a tool for learning and business as a tool for social change. It's very, very important to recognize as we think about the devastation of mass incarceration in our country, to understand that we're talking about, at this point, 2.3 million people who are currently incar incarcerated throughout our country. 65 million people at this point who are on some kind of oversight supervision. I have a mentor in the space, a person named Glenn Martin, who, who runs a remarkable organization called Just Leadership USA. And I saw, I saw him speak on Friday. He said to me, or not just to me, but to the group of people he was speaking about, what we really need to recognize in the devastation that we've created in the frame of mass incarceration is that the work we do now to rethink justice, we cannot think about you people. 65 million people is not you people. It is we people. And I believe that business has a role to play in that social change. It is incredibly important that we also think about, through the work that we're doing, the work of human connection. And we recognize for us that food is a form of that connection. We use, well, actually our, our, our model, our business model in the use of food is that we recognize that we have an opportunity to uh, reinvest in local economy. So we actually are the only food truck in all of New York City that sources all of our food from local farms. Uh, and we recognize that through the ability to um, reinvest in local economies, we're also thinking about how potentially to shift the economy of upstate New York away from the prison industrial complex and a little bit closer to an other industry in the form of agriculture. Food is a tool for human connection. One of the most amazing things that we see in the experience of drive change and the experience of uh, our fellows at the food truck is the moment of engagement with the customer. We recognize that through that moment of engagement, we actually have an opportunity to dispel preconceived notion about other. And the actual mobility of our initiative really truly allows us to do that. Now, not just is it important for us to think about uh, the role that we're playing in this space from um, an educational standpoint, but if we're gonna be a business in the space, we have to recognize the way that market value is gonna allow us to make an impact in the industry. Our food truck won the Vendi Award for best food truck in New York City in uh, the fall. Uh, they, yes, you can clap, come on. Uh, and what, remarkably, it, 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 aside from that just being truly like uh, one of the, honestly, best days of uh, my life, certainly. Um, it is uh, recognizing that by entering into this space, by entering into this market and thinking about how we run an efficient business model, thinking about how we think about the ways in which all aspects of our business can be tied back uh, to social impact, it's also a way for us to connect with other small business owners and it, to demonstrate through action that this is something where you can actually be a part of this mission as well. 
the credibility that we gain by something like the Bendy Award allows us to think about how not just one uh, fellowship on one food truck um, helps to work towards social change, but really think about how across industry, as business owners, as opportunity holders, we have the power to use that opportunity for social good. We also use our food service as a tool for actual advocacy, getting out in the community, raising awareness about injustice inside of the system, recognizing that the mobility of what we do allows us to really build community and build momentum around this work. Uh, in terms of the way in which we structure our model, we're in a space where we're recognizing that we want to be all about investing in people rather than investing in punishment. It costs $163,000 a year to incarcerate somebody on Rikers Island for one year. For us to work with one fellow, it costs about $42,000 a year, including full-time pay payment. So when we think about investing in people rather than investing in punishment, it's a call to action here to get the community to think about how we shift our sense of where our money should go to have the society that we all want to be a part of. We're structured as a hybrid, so this is just a breakdown for us of the ways in which we secure our revenue through uh, philanthropy as well as our own earned revenue model. And we've also been fortunate enough to get quite a good amount of press and recognition for the work that we're doing, which I hope truly is an opportunity to leverage and to connect to work with other, uh, certainly with other food truck owners, but across industry to think about how we collectively use business as a tool for learning and use business as a tool for social change. It is 100% my sense and idea uh, and desire that the words social enterprise sort of become obsolete with the understanding that all enterprise should have the impact for social good. And at Drive Change, we're in a position where we want to uh, support other opportunity holders through this process, through the ability to recognize that power and to recognize that power as a means to hire individuals who are coming home, to think about the impact we have on society, and to really shift the power, power, power sorry, to shift the power paradigm from investing in punishment to investing in people. Collectively together, we truck towards a better tomorrow. And collectively together, we have the opportunity to broaden access to opportunity for young people coming home and to turn red lights green. Thank you.